I am Leia Mazu and I guess I have this passionate love for people so I want to better help people see the best side of them so they can contribute to the society. My name is William and in the future I would like to follow my passion into studying psychology and raising a beautiful family with kids. My name is Bintu. I would like to study business administration in the future and become a big business woman. Hi, my name is Ahmed Al Hajj and my dream is to make a big difference in my community and in my family. The Kemba is home to a large segment of the Muslim population in Sydney. Located 15 kilometres southwest of Sydney CBD, it is estimated that 70% of the Kemba residents were born overseas. It has become a place people of the Muslim faith call their home, in a country that provides them with the peace and freedom that many have sought, having fled conflicts and upheaval in their countries of origin. It has become a place where the next generation were raised amongst the minarets of the Lakemba Mosque, the smell of mixed plates enticing visitors and reminding residents of a place far away. Australia is a country built on migration. We all come from somewhere. Some have been here longer than others, but what it means to belong, to feel accepted as part of the community, is different for some Australians. Born and raised in Lebanon, and then they came here in the 70s. Both my sisters were, were born in Lebanon as well, and then I was born here. I think like they've actually confused me more. My parents allowed me to go to a very Australian primary school, uh, a very Australian high school, um, Whereas my sisters went to different high schools that were a little bit more multicultural and different primary schools, um, which again, there was like a lot more Lebanese, Turkish, Afghans. I think coming home and hanging out with the family made me realise how I'm really not Lebanese. I'm really not Australian either. Essentially when someone says, you know, oh, what's your nationality? Like the first thing I'll say is Lebanese. So I don't essentially connect myself as being Australian more than Lebanese. I'll always say I'm Lebanese first. You know, I was probably the only Lebanese Muslim in my grade from primary school and high school. Um, culturally, I've always had cult cultural issues. I don't really know how to be more Lebanese because I've just always been so, hey, how are you going? And I'd get confused because I'd come home and mum's got this like Lebanese food and mum's, mum and dad are speaking to me in Arabic and I reply to them back in English. Me and my sister are watching news in Arabic, but then essentially I'm going to be like, oh, mum, I'm going out and all my friends are Australians. So, and we, you know, we're probably going to the restaurant that they've chosen to go to. So I guess like, yeah, I just get really, really confused. I do switch between the Lebanese identity and Australian identity. When I'm at work, I'm embracing the Australian identity because I feel like I'm in their culture, I'm working their hours. But as soon as I leave work and I head home and I start praying and eating like, the Lebanese food and talking Arabic around the house, I straight away feel like I'm back at home and embracing the Lebanese identity. Also, when I'm like walking around the streets of, like say for example, Lakemba or Greenacre, when there's a large group of Muslims, I feel like I'm, I'm my Leban I come from a Lebanese background. But then when I'm walking around uh, an area just full of Australian and say for example Vietnamese, I feel like I'm embracing like the Australian culture, I feel like I'm Australian again. Why some people do say, no, nah, I'm Lebanese, I'm not Australian, even though they were born in Australia. But grew up in a household saying, I'm Lebanese. Well, in fact, they were, they're from Lebanon. Lebanese, my uncle's Lebanese, my auntie's Lebanese. They don't really hear the term I'm Australian at home because they would be the first uh, uh, next uh, group of people in that family who are born in Australia. So as if they are not used to saying that they are Australian, so they say, no, I'm Lebanese. I'm not Australian, I'm Lebanese. Maybe because it's something that they're not used to. Calling yourself Australian is the truth. I'm born in Australia. And at first, even in my own case, saying I'm Australian 
you know, from years and years ago, this was something new to me because in my household was something that I wasn't used to hearing. My grandparents, my parents, my uncles and my aunties, born in Lebanon. That's all I heard, I'm Lebanese. So when I started saying I'm Australian, I was like, wow, that's, that's a new word in my mouth. It, it felt different. If there's anything that irritates me, uh, it's when I hear people refer to my ethnicity and say, oh, you know, I'm Lebanese or I'm Pakistani, and then they refer to me and they'll say, oh yeah, but you're Australian. And it's, well, no. I'm no more Australian than, than they were either the day they were born or the day they took a citizenship oath. Uh, if we're going to define people in terms of their country of origin for their ancestry, then I'm Irish. Uh, if, they're, if they're not Australian, I'm not Australian. Uh, from the day I was born and the day either they were born or they became citizens, uh, regardless of ethnic heritage, uh, we're Australian. From engaging with a lot of young people, what I've found is that when they meet people for the first time, they ask, you know, where are they from? And they say, oh, we're Australian because they were born in Australia. And the person would say, no, no, where are you, where are you from? You know, and yeah, I was born in Australia, but where are your parents from? So they insist on, you know, identifying them from what culture they are. So I think that, you know, confuses young people and, uh, like makes them think that, you know, they need to be identified not just only as Australian but other cultural backgrounds. As we go on in life, we're adopting different identities. So we, you know, a male or female, then we're a son, daughter, um, brother, sister. As we grow up, you know, we become an employee, we become a partner, husband and wife, so on. So as we get new identity, we don't take off the other identities. So when I came to Australia, I was a Lebanese. So when I became an Australian citizen, you know, I'm still a proud Lebanese, but I'm also proud to be Australian. You know, as human beings, we are, um, I guess, made to be able to um, balance the different identities in life. It doesn't mean once you become one, you can't be all the others. So I think all this confusion, all this, you know, always Muslims having to justify or not, f not feel that they are loyal to being Australian. It's not true because we can have many identities. Um, and when we did this work in South Western Sydney of a very broad variety of, of immigrants, including the majority of whom were second generation, that is, they were born in Australian, very few said outright they were Australian. They might say they're Lebanese Australian or they're um, Filipino Australian or they're Samoan Islander Australian. At the same time, uh, their identities were sort of quite fluid, but I don't see that as a problem at all uh, because I think it reflects the contemporary world. It reflects their background, uh, the background of their parents and their grandparents. Uh, it reflects their, um, their contemporary networks, their connectedness through social media and through sort of telecommunications to a global world. And particularly for young people, these things are very fluid and very changing. So to me, um, that is no challenge at all to uh, social cohesion of Australian society. Cultures help us to make sense of the world and give us meaning, a role and a guide to live our lives by. For the Muslim community, culture is drawn from Muslim values. At the cornerstone is family. I would probably uh, do the complete opposite to what my parents did. Uh, I know it sounds a bit funny, but um, I would probably want to put them in a different school that's got a lot more cultures in it, or put them in a religious school or a private school, or even a private Catholic school because I know that the education system is really good. And essentially I could just teach them religion at home as long as they're very culturally sensitive and religiously sensitive and then they know more about other people. Um, I'm not really involved in the Lebanese community. I mean, it's not that I haven't tried, but every time I, I've ever had the opportunity to, I guess I, I kind of uh, recluse from it straight away. I think it's because I feel like an alien. Like I do feel very, like I feel like an outsider. Um, but I mean, I do uh, voluntary work for my sister on Tuesdays, uh, which is only a very recent thing. Um, and that's, that's actually located in Lakemba. It's really, yeah, it's really strange to explain, but I would get so nervous. Like anyone told me like, 
Bankstown, the Kemba, Greenacre, any of those areas, like I would just freak out. Um, I couldn't stand going to the station. I don't know why. Like I just thought, you know, these people will, they'll either judge me, they won't understand me. What if someone starts talking to me in Arabic and my Arabic's really bad? And Or what if someone starts, you know, like, I just, I don't know, I just have a hundred and one things going through my mind at the time. And I was like, you know, I just, and it's strange because you go back to how you feel comfortable. So when I was in these areas, I'd act more Australian. Whereas if you go back to back to when I was in my house, I'd act more like Le more Lebanese. So even it confused the hell out of me. After dinner, Leal takes the opportunity to discuss her upbringing with her family. I haven't really like I haven't travelled other than Lebanon and Malaysia, but I think if I was to choose a country to live in, it would probably just be Australia. In Australia. And, I, and I think the reason why is because like there's no country where it's like you go to Auburn and you feel like you're in Turkey, you know, you go to Lakemba, you feel like you're in Lebanon, you know, mm. you go to Pendle Hill or you go to Harris Park, you're in India, mm. you know, you go to Cabramatta and you're, you're amongst Vietnamese, mm. you know, like there's no country where it's like there's different sub... Multicultural. Yeah, little yeah. subcontinents because, you know, it is multicultural despite the fact that... So do you think that bringing, bringing us up in Winston Hills was like a good, like it was a good thing? Yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't that bad. But like, what's the, what's the good, good things about it? What was the bad things about it? Well, the good thing that you grow up in Australian society. Yeah. Um, because you are Australian. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the bad thing that you've been far from the Muslim community, community late eighties, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, the eighty eight. Um, the most of the Lebanese people yeah, here they have a bad name, mm. uh, especially after the war. Yeah, dad That's had that generation of the war. Dad had bit, so I was afraid. Yeah, but in Australia, if you try to say to someone it's wrong to have a boyfriend in high school or ever in your life, they'll think you're crazy. Yeah, they're like, what's wrong with you? You're insulting our way of life. If you say to someone, I don't want to drink like you, oh. or they're like, like, or you. dress like you, I don't yeah. want to show my body like you, they think you're insulting them. They think, why are you attacking you my way of life? Them, you know. Mayal is going out with a male friend, and for some in her community, it may not be culturally appropriate. So, essentially this is probably linking to one of the scenarios that did make me feel guilty with hanging out with someone, but um, I was hanging out with my friend, with um, a Turkish friend of mine, and he also went to my high school, and it was funny because I was also hanging out with an Australian friend of mine, and she went to the bathroom, and we were actually at a public setting, we were at Hungry Jack's. Anyway, it just so happened that someone that um, knew my family quite well, that was similar age group to me, he walked in and he saw me. And because I've got nothing to hide and because I wasn't doing anything wrong, I figured, you know, the best thing I should do, even though it seems like a very awkward circumstance, was to call him over and say, Salam Aleikum, which is pretty much saying hello and peace be upon you because he was Muslim as well. So essentially I brought him over. I said, oh, you know, this is my friend and vice versa. And I wasn't willing to explain the fact that my friend is in the bathroom and she was a girl because it doesn't sound it's not something that you would really do it doesn't really it doesn't really make sense to be like oh yeah there's a girl and she was in the bathroom you know it's it's not you know it's not really appropriate so essentially he left spoke bad words about me and that's where the guilt came in because even though I wasn't doing anything wrong I think essentially the reason why I was so it was such a big deal was because that's my family's reputation on the line um, that's me and my religion. Um, that's and you know my my um, I guess my reputation's been skewed, and it's you know and it's not fair because I actually wasn't doing anything wrong. This happened to me much when I was um, quite younger, and um, essentially that just brought guilt because it's more of my family's reputation. Because at the end of the day, it's my family's last name that I withhold, and if I'm if I'm displaying that in a, in a wrong way in public. It's, a, it's, you know, it, it causes family dilemma. Growing up, my parents were, the, the way I was raised, I was never allowed to hang out with a group of girls. By saying that in today's society, you can never stop a boy and a girl talking. Say for example, once I went to, they, they, they also sent me to an all boys school, just to stop me from talking to girls. So the main taboos would be drinking, clubbing, associating with girls outside of, of marriage, um, Sex before marriage is obviously really big, and then it comes down to like cultural. There's a lot of cultural things.
things you're not supposed to do. And then it comes down to family. Your family also set different rules on you as well. Bintu is a 24-year-old refugee from Sierra Leone. She came when she was 16 years old with her grandmother, married and pregnant, thinking she would be shortly reunited with her husband. I want to teach her things that she can live anywhere in the world, even though I'm not there, even though the father is not there. She can look after herself. She can be strong, you know? And for my country, there are certain things, especially the culture, some things you teach your kids and they get hold of it, it helps them anywhere they go. Bintu became a single mother when an error on her husband's visa application prevented him from coming to Australia and joining the family. Today is a special day for Bintu. Her six-year-old daughter, Amina, has been elected as a class captain. was given to my daughter in the school. So she brought it home and then I put on the fridge. All of these qualities that two believers should have them. All of these things that are here, salvation, belief, you have to be a fearing somebody, you have to be forgiving. You always have to have hope, you know, like try to unite with people, unite with other people do things that will bring peace, generally. Have strong faith in Him, He's the Almighty. The rewards are many. As a Muslim and a true believer, there are certain things you cannot do. There are certain things you have to restrict yourself from doing because you know they are not good. So being you married or being single, it's the same. So in my own case, I love my God. I love him so much, I feel bad when I know inside I'm doing something that is not godly. So with that, it's affecting my, my emotions. I'm a matured woman. There are times when I need to associate with a man. But because I know it's not good in the other way around, the person is not my husband, I don't, I don't even want to think about it. So with that, it's a big factor that is affecting me. Because I need to be close to a man who is my husband. I'll be more confident. I'll know I'm doing the right thing. Well, in, in my case, in growing up, when I was in school, I, I used to go to school in what was classified as one of the worst schools in Sydney. And um, in growing up there, going through from year 7 to year 12 into that school, I ended up learning from that and from after leaving school how many things that I can do to help, how many people that I can reach, whether it be whether I'm at work right now, uh, or outside of work and I can do that throughout the whole day and night and this was something that really clicked into me and I uh, really went for it. In regards to my, uh, what, what my you know, scope of thinking in raising my kids, I want them, and this is what I try very much to do, I want them to be inclusive. I don't want them to be the type where if something affected them, even slightly, that they will straight away draw themselves out and say that's it, I'm not going to include myself in anything anymore. I want them to be strong, I want them to be able, confident and able that if something were to arise, that they're able to deal with it in the proper way, in a smart, wise way and keep a smile on their face. We've known for a long time uh, that young people 
uh, have problems with parents, with parents' generation. And that's irrespective of whether they're sort of immigrant background or not. Uh, that there's intergenerational clashes and young people finding their way. With um, young immigrants, um, often we find that the parents come and they want to sort of recreate uh, the, the life back in the old country, the values there, um, the expectations, the behaviour. Uh, and of course Australia is a very different society. And in many ways too, back home has also changed dramatically, but sort of often parents have an expectation of a time war, but a sort of a snapshot of when they left, when back home's also changed. So this puts a lot of pressure on young people and a lot of tension between uh, parents uh, immigrant parents and their children in Australia. Adolescence is the time in which you are determining your purpose in life, what your contribution to the world will be, your legacy. These are big decisions for all of us, no matter what your background is. Despite government assistance, Bintu needs to work to provide the basic necessities for her and her daughter. Bintu has been looking for a full-time job for a while, but has only managed to secure work for two days as security in a supermarket in a distant suburb. She then has to get up very early to fix breakfast for Amina and get ready for work. If I'm going to work, I work in the morning. That's when I'm leaving the house. Bintu has to first drop Amina off at a friend's place since she can't afford any other childcare arrangements. There are times like I want to take him in a house. Not that I don't get sometimes the money, but it's not sufficient because like other things I have to do for Amina, like food, lunch, you know. So like it's pretty different if you're going out on an occasion and you're not getting that kind of money. If you're getting extra money, that is simple. You go out maybe once in a while, you say, okay, let me take my daughter to watch a movie. Let me take to let me take her to Easter time to Easter shows. It all involves money. But if you have money, but it's like you haven't finished spending on the basic things, you don't want to use it to go and socialize because you don't have somebody else to ask. I chose to do community services because obviously I think everyone needs help and I think that it's really important to have support systems and services and other people to depend on when things get rough and obviously everyone goes through different stages in their life where they go through difficulty but essentially um, it's also because I'm really passionate about youth so I always thought that it would be best if I kind of got into the youth field as well. 
And my main point of this class is to make sure that everybody understands that um, our beliefs and our value systems and our stereotypes affect how we work in the industry and affect how we are as workers. So where we come from as individuals impacts on who? Our community, yeah, our family, our community and then our roles as workers. Confident, that's a good one. Charming. Attractive. Hmm. What about your inner self? Uh, Attractive. <laughs> Attractive. Like today what we did was obviously I figured out that there's a lot more positive things about myself than, than I thought because I guess everyone's not essentially born arrogant and they can't really just sit there and be like, oh, you know, I'm good at this, I'm great at that. It probably really helped with figuring out who the good things about me, so then I guess it's really key to then figure out the good things about my classmates and then figure out the good things about people in general. Every week, Leal spends a day with her sister in a no interest loan scheme as a way to give back to the community. Um, the main reason why I decided to volunteer work for my sister is because I needed to understand the admin side of community services and also because I don't get to see my sister as often as I'd like. So it's also a good way for me to hang out with my sister. Hey, how are you going? Um, is this Bankstown Square's Dick Smith? Excellent. Um, I'm just calling on behalf of a no interest loan scheme organisation. I was just wondering, is there a manager? Uh, is there any uh, manager around that I'd be able to speak to? No interest loan scheme organisation, and we tend to have a lot of customers that um, that are in the area that would end up wanting to um, buy something with like a no interest. And we we were just wondering if we could bring uh, if we could build maybe a, a good rapport with you guys. And it's also stepping out of my uh, comfort zone, so it's going into an area that I'm not necessarily familiar with and um, yeah so I think it's, it's really good that I'm, I'm doing volunteer work for my sister on Tuesdays. Um, I'm currently studying Diploma of Community Services at Carrick Education and I would like to further into my studies into Bachelor of Psych and Forensic Psychology. Um, I've always had a passion in um, helping people especially people that don't feel within themselves so it's always been an interest in helping, helping and talking and sitting them down and really helping them out. If you look at unemployment rates, uh, the unemployment rates of Muslim Australians are much higher uh, than uh, the unemployment rates of other people. In fact, the only group with a higher unemployment rate than Muslim Australians are Indigenous Australians. Um, so uh, if you look at that, uh, there are a number of things at play there. I think one is racial discrimination in the labour market. What that means is when people of a particular name or a particular appearance or a particular dress apply for a job, uh, they often they won't get an interview or they won't get passed and through the interview. And there's a number of sort of very rigorous academic uh, bits of research, uh, fairly contemporary, that say that yes, this does happen in Australia today. It's just not fiction. Uh, there's very solid evidence for that. Uh, and I think that, you know, sort of there are other things that then lay behind that educational outcomes may not be as sort of strong. Uh, and um, it's about where people live, because a lot of employment locally, say in Western and South Western Sydney, uh, very high rates of unemployment compared to other places. So looking for jobs in your local area, if you're a Muslim and you live in that area, Western Social, uh, South Western Sydney, uh, there just aren't the jobs available. There is fear of the unknown, you know. Some organisations that have never met a Muslim person before, just from what they hear, you know, if you only hear the negative things about the community, naturally you're going to have a fear of employing someone from that community. So the minute you see Muhammad or a woman with a scarf, you're going to automatically feel that, you know, because I've only heard, oh, they need special space to pray, they have high needs. Um, so you have this fear of, you know, like, I don't know how to specially cater for that person, so they prefer not to employ them. But, you know, the Muslim community, I mean, there is research to show that the young, young Muslims are among the highest, you know, educated in the you know, minority groups, yet that they have the highest unemployment, and that is because of discrimination. So, I mean, but for a culturally competent organisation that know how to deal with different cultures, will appreciate the value of having, you know, people from different cultures, you know, different imagination, different contribution to the workplace. But racism manifests in multiple ways. Um, it manifests 
I think the one that we're most obvious of are cultural ways, so, you know, stereotypical representations, also negative representations of peoples. But I think that also, you know, when we focus our anti-racism uh, activities and strategies on that, uh, I think we often miss out larger structural issues, uh, poverty, uh, unemployment, uh, poor education levels, uh, inability to access uh, political and other forms of social life. Those things are really important to a community actually being able to create itself and to live a good life. Stories of racial vilification and discrimination are common amongst the Muslim community. This is translated into poorer social indicators in the areas of employment, educational outcomes and well-being. It also leaves a permanent scar on young minds. I had um, my deputy principal uh, talk to me prior about how I should, I should you know, think about going to TAFE and doing some Arabic classes as well as being at high school so I could do it via correspondence or do it once a, once a week. And um, he told me, meet me at, in the office, just at the chair inside and wait for me there um, after recess and I'll talk to you about it. And I'm like, okay, cool, sweet. So after recess, you know, I sat down and it was really funny because I had the principal come up to me and say, oh, typical of your kind to be sitting here at recess in trouble. And essentially, if anyone knows my uh, character, especially when I was in high school, I used to, um, I used to usually fight back, I'd get really angry and very passionate very quickly, but essentially I figured if you've got someone that's a, an authority figure, which essentially you have to respect, and you've got someone that is ignorant, um, and I am, you know, hard, like quarter his age, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to say anything to him, so I just said yes, that's exactly right, sir. Everyone was sharing their own food, but then when I go and share my own food, They'll be like, oh, yuck, what's that? You know, I don't want no food. So then I'll be like left outside and people who didn't like Muslims and especially Lebanese. So then they wouldn't let their kids hang around Lebanese backgrounds. So then I had a few students come up to me saying, you know, they couldn't be my friend no more. So that felt very harsh. And yeah, I definitely felt left out. They had such a stereotypical view that every Muslim could possibly do something that dangerous. It was just really pathetic. Towards my mother, yeah, she's one who wears the headscarf where someone actually chased us in the car and tried to uh, scare my mother while we were driving. Now, it's been, I've never forgotten that, I'll, and I don't think I will for a long time. Australia, like really like any nation, will have pockets of every form of prejudice and pockets of every form of understanding and richness. And I think if we characterise, you know, oh, there's, the media is all Islamophobic, we're not being much better than the ones who are prejudiced. Uh, the key to an understanding of multiculturalism is to be accurate. And I think if we give an inaccurate portrayal of the media, we're not much better. Uh, there are many programs which accurately pro portray Australia. There are many commentators who do a wonderful job. I've come across people that have experienced, you know, people swearing at them through, from cars or spitting at them or throwing eggs at them. I feel there's discrimination everywhere and it's not just towards Muslims, towards a lot of other communities that are, you know, new to Australia, that have language problems, that have accents or that look different to the, I guess, Anglo or blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, stereotype. I mean, how we experience it is, is specific. It's tied to the historical period that we're in. Um, so, for example, for Muslims in Australia right now, it's really tied to um, the threat of terrorism. It's tied to September 11. So, historical events, um, international events, those affect how racism is articulated. But I feel that racism at the root is still about how uh, people are managed within a society and what kinds of access they have to those resources. Um, so my uh, particular line of thinking is that racism emerges historically through the colonial period, particularly as a way for uh, colonisers to manage the colonised. And from there it's emerged in multiple different ways across multiple contexts. So I think we have to be really careful because um, you know, even while we're recognising the specificity of our own experiences, I think we also need to actually branch out 
and realise that other people are also facing these problems. And if we work together, it would be a lot easier um, instead of actually fighting each other, which is, I think, unfortunately, what we actually tend to do. There are some people, and it's true, it's not, it's not a secret, it's not a secret. We know that there are certain people who treat Muslims in a different way because they are a Muslim. There are some people like that. Would I say from my personal experience that all Australians are like that? No way. No way. I've had doors opened for me from people of a non-Muslim background very easy and very quickly. And very quickly. Learning the Islamic teachings is an important matter. In this case, when you learn the Islamic teachings, you become more knowledgeable. You learn how to show manners. You know about moderation. You know how to speak. You know how to hold yourself. You know how to project yourself. Those who are far away from learning this, what happens is they become so fixed on the point that look how he's treating me. Look how he's talking to me. Is it because I'm Muslim he's talking to me like this? This, this notion itself is going to set that person back. Why? They've already gone on the back step now. They're going to be on the defensive. The Canola riots was a tremendous shock. And yet here we wake up and we see, not only in Australia, but all over the world, the visions of the uh, Australian flag wrapped around drunk young males who are trying to bash anyone who looks vaguely dark-skinned, vaguely Muslim, vaguely. And, and that was a pretty horrid thing. And the thing about Cronulla Beach is important. It's the only beach you can reach by train, by public transport. And there's been a long tradition of people from the western suburbs going to the beach. The racist history of Australia, and it's very clear when you look, uh, still persist in some areas. Um, and we need to be ever vigilant against racism and never sort of take our eye off that ball. On the other hand, it also tells us that if that's the worst we've had in Sydney in 60 years of post-war immigration, and it is, other than, say, the individual attacks on Muslim uh, women and others after 9-11, but in terms of the, uh, the riot, that's the race riot we've had, then if that's the worst we've had, we're actually travelling pretty well. So in a strange way, the horrific nature of that event tells us that we need to really worry about racism, but also that in the main, that's not the way in which Sydney lives. In the main, people get on. The community provides a central point for local Muslims to share their identity and celebrate the culture to feel the sense of belonging which some Australians take for granted. Ahmed works for the Islamic College full time. For Ahmed, the Islamic College is more than a workplace, it's the community that he cares for and tries to defend. Yep. Ahmed gave a short tour around the college. As you can see from the sign here, this is an uh, Islamic school. Uh, it's called Salama College. We're currently standing right now in the reception area for the school at Salama College. And uh, we do have about 70 staff, including teachers and admin, working together. This is the Salama College uh, Mosque. It's within the compounds of Salama College and it's called Masjid as Salam. And as you can see, it fits up about 500 people over here. And there's been such a large increase in these areas for uh, acquiring the knowledge of the religion and uh, a place to come and pray. We're standing in front of a year two classroom and year one over there and you can see all on the walls all the artwork that they're starting to put up and also just uh, doing a big function over here for Harmony Day as well. And you can see that the main focus is to teach them when it comes to English, Arabic, shapes, colors, and numeracy, as well as literacy, of course, is very important. And they do teach the uh, rules of the religion as well as the Islamic belief as well. It explains the significance of some of the important religious celebrations. Well, you know, the two celebrations of Eid, uh, and this is Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. 
Uh, these are two major celebrations for us in the Muslim community. As for Eid al-Fitr, they call it the celebration of the feast. And that is the one that we celebrate after the month of fasting in Ramadan. Uh, it is massive. It means a lot to us. Uh, it is uh, something which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us about. As for the other one, Eid al-Adha, uh, that is one that occurs after the Muslims go and perform pilgrimage. And uh, it's a massive celebration as well. And we all come together. We hold big commemoration, uh, celebrations, as you know, in this, around Australia. And on top of all of that, families come together, bonds become stronger, they feed one another, and they visit each other for, for days after each other. It's a beautiful celebration. Even when it comes to the mainstream, I do feel there are people of the Muslim community here in Australia easily blending in, blending in fine. Uh, they live amongst each other, they smile to one another and the like. In regards to within the Muslim community, there are many, many, many people strongly bonded together in the Muslim community. The, the Muslim community has been in Australia for a long time, you know, since the 1700s, there's history documenting that, you know, they've been here. So, um, you know, the people, I guess, that we always hear about, it's the minority group. And there's, you know, a majority of Muslims are well integrated into the community, they're working and they, you know, work, use mainstream services and are involved in many um, initiatives. There are some innovative initiatives run by the Muslim community and service agencies designed to reduce racism in Australia. The Police Safety Forum is an important occasion for dialogue between the police and the local community. Uh, sometimes it's hard for the um, you know, local communities who, who, um, to, to get to know their local police. Um, it can be intimidating, especially when they get involved with police. They're not sure the processes and it's good to just be able to break down the, the, ba the barriers between police and, and the local communities. <laughs> um, during, during their training at Speed Sports Club, because majority of our members are from the Muslim background, we do teach them to be very, very tolerant of others. We do teach them to be um, more accepting. We do teach them that you are a role model for the Muslim community. I mean, this, this becomes um, a very professional sport at the age of nine. You can become a state champion and a national champion at the age of nine. So these kids at a very young age have got a responsibility. And when they take their first step into a professional career at that age, we do also explain to them that you are doing the Muslim community proud. Uh, your name is either Muhammad, Ahmed, Mustafa. So people know your identity out there when you are called onto the, onto the mats in a, in a tournament. Instead of these kids growing up on the streets and um, being exposed to things that um, we don't want them to be exposed, so they come, they get used to playing sport, whether it's karate or another sport in general, but these kids, a lot of them are, are state champions. They come to the sports club to train, they come meet new people over here because we get new, um, new registrations every year. Sheikh Ibrahim El Shafi is a spiritual leader amongst the Muslim community in Sydney and he has a short message to share. All praise is due to Allah, and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, and Prophet Moses, and all the prophets who were the best example to all mankind. The Muslim community in Australia has increased dramatically, especially in the last decade. In Sydney, for example, in western suburbs, the Muslims would form approximately 20% of the population in these Western regions. As Muslims and as uh, preachers about Islam, we know that the most destructive element for uh, the citizens is ignorance. When one is ignorant about his religion, he might take the extreme. So to make sure that the youth are getting the proper information about Islam that will protect them from being dragged away from the proper teachings and they might be subject to extremism. And that's a dangerous thing for the youth to happen. The one who is ignorant, yeah, he might be dragged to extremism. Educating our youth will eradicate the possibility 
of having any form of extremism in our community. They belong to this place that gave them safety and that gave them uh, opportunities to work and to learn. So let the Muslims be proud of their identity as Australians. That's number one. That's something not to feel shy of or to feel ashamed about. No, we are proud. We are Australians. We belong to this country. And at the same time, we are Muslims. That's something based on our culture. So we practice our religion as Muslims, as there are many others who practice their religions. But what is common between all of them is that they are all Australians. I think it's horrific that people will view a situation where many people who share culture want to live near each other. Uh, people will always congregate where there's familiarity, and in particular, people will congregate around places of religious worship. Uh, now, the section of Beverly Hills where, where I grew up uh, used, to be pop used to be advertised by the real estate agents as being a popular Catholic area. No one viewed that as a problem. No one complained about it. And yet, if you have Lakemba described as a popular Muslim area, people will say, oh, it's a ghettoisation of the area. Rubbish. It's not at all. People quite rightly want to live closer to their place of worship. That's not a problem. Ahmed broadcasts a radio program on Thursdays. During this program, he and his brothers try to educate Muslims on the truth of the Islamic faith. And, uh, we are at the Muslim Community Radio Station at 92.1 to MFM Studios right now. We teach those matters that we were talking about earlier, the true teachings of Islam. Uh, day and night we talk about these matters. We also broadcast the uh, call to the prayer times as well on air. We put the recitation of the Qur'an, which you can hear in the background. And we currently uh, have a show called The Brothers Panel, which we come together. And we go live on air as well, talking about certain matters, reading out some stories and uh, go through certain uh, chapters of knowledge as well as giving certain types of advices on air as well and that's what we do over here monitors monitors up 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 Go for it. Welcome dear listeners and you are tuned in to 92.1 to MFM Muslim Community Radio and you're with us on the Brothers Panel. A big welcome to our listeners, whether tuned in via 92.1 to MFM or via the 2MFM.org web link. And inshallah, we're going to say a big thank you to the brothers with us in the studio. You're with myself, Ahmed, as well as brother Yusuf, brother Ro'ed, and brother Farooq here in the studio. How are you tonight, guys? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, barakallahu fikum. September 11 was an event that took place in the United States, yet its impact has been felt by every Muslim in Australia. It was years after, like yeah, at, really at the time you were in school. high school, yeah. and all the riots had happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think that's all. You know, <laughs> Lebanese people were being depicted in the media. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. The know, only, a lot more. Yeah, the only time in high school anybody actually took the time to notice that I was Muslim was what? the day. Uh, the day that September 11 happened. Yeah. When I got to school, people turned around in class and like actually asked me, Tamir and Muhammad, the only other th three Muslim guy. They, we were the three Muslims in our history class. Mm. They all stopped and stared at us like, 
could you please explain? <laughs> and we were like, are you kidding me? What, what? Like, I didn't mastermind the oh thing. Why do I have to explain but, it to you? But yeah. suddenly it was our seamers now, seamers are Muslim. It's not just and that was Lebanese. A real turning and one and um, every time I tried to speak up, you know, In nobody course. would listen. Mm. Yeah, it was really difficult. So what was she? Yeah, she wouldn't let you teacher. speak? Like, she wouldn't let you defend? She just would, wouldn't listen. And I was too shaken up because I felt like it was an attack against me and I needed to stand up for Islam but I didn't I also didn't have the knowledge and the confidence to really defend it yeah or like um you know correct correct what, yeah because you're younger she's your teacher and yeah. you're like 14 15 you feel like they're the authority yeah, really and and the, your dad was the scared after of September 11 that oh. I'd get myself into like <laughs> Oh, really? mm. Tricky situations with my debating. Mm. He's like, don't say anything at school oh. tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, no, it's okay, Dad. It's all right. I'm like, don't worry about it. I did yeah, because it's nothing to do with he us as a Muslim. Heated um, conversation. Um, no, this was after the Cronulla riots. Mm. I went to the beach. I went to Manly Beach with a hijab on. Yeah. And I had someone tell me to go back to my own country. Yeah. That I don't belong here. Like, it's um, like. And that I should take my scarf off and that kind of Such thing. Random stuff. But all my Australian friends were defending me. I didn't say anything. Um, and they were all defending oh, me, no. saying she doesn't want to get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> She's yeah. covered up because she doesn't want to get cancer. Yeah, yeah and just That's to leave hilarious. me alone. Yeah. I've had Australian friends who dress like me, like they, they've converted to Islam, been be told to go back to their own country. <laughs> And they're like, where should I go, Kuji? Because that's where they were born and raised. raised. And they're like, you know, do you want me to go back to Randwick Hospital? Like, I don't yeah, understand. Like I do see that like, the older generation still, and they have their right, you know, they they were growing up throughout their terrorist attacks and stuff, so they have their right to just to believe whatever they want to believe. But Muslims shouldn't be associated with terrorism because a terrorist isn't a Muslim. A terrorist is whoever does something to do with bombs, say, for example. It's not Muslim. Muslims got nothing to do with that. Yeah. It is the majority's view of the Muslim community that we do not do such acts at, as took place in uh, on September 11. It is the majority view that that minority, that minority who hold this view of killing people and doing what they did, this was then shown on media. Then there was this term which I do not use in reference to these extremists. They call them Islamists, yeah? The beginning of this word, Islam, yeah? What, what, what is this, what view, what picture is this going to give those who are watching and listening? They're going to think this is what Islam is about. And of course, it is the view of the majority of the Muslim nation that we don't do such acts, but we were painted with the same brush as those extremists by certain people of the Australian community who were holding some uh, positions high up there in the government, which was obvious on TV in the media. The media is still talking about it till now and using the terms Islamists, Jihadists and the like. And I don't, you, I don't think you know how frustrated I get when I hear that. Uh, but it is post 9-11, I think, sort of escalated this. And there's uh, the Human Rights Commission did a number of uh, bits of uh, research to show that uh, a number of Muslim uh, women wearing the veil because they're invisible and others really were victims of quite substantial sort of abuse and violence in public places and spaces. So I think that's what's changed to some extent, that there's a, an historical continuity about racist response to newly arriving cohorts of immigrants over time. But 9-11 in a sense escalated it. And unfortunately, I think it's Muslim Australians who have borne the burden of that. When we, said, when we say the word jihad, this does not mean go and start killing women, old men and children and such and such. You know what? Even in our community, in the Muslim nation as a whole, the majority view that when we say jihad, we mean go and teach the proper teachings of the Islamic religion. But unfortunately, that term now today has been uh, put into the same spectrum as killing people, as children, women, 
uh, men walking about their daily lives, going to work, becomes very, very distressing, very frustrating. I think there is an institutional bias that's carried over from our past, from our colonial past. And the major, uh, for me, one of the major problems is the application of culture in uh, systems of policing, in terms of uh, understanding crime, etc. So all those things uh, causes problems for us because um, we try to explain ethnic crime as something that's attached to that particular culture, but we would never apply the same logic um, to a majority group, in, the, in our case, you know, white Australians. So um, that's one of the problems. But there is an institutional bias um, as well in terms of who's counted as citizens and who's not, who's counted as belonging and who is not. So you know, there's this sort of often used in, in media and, and um, government will also say things like this where, um, you know, we'll, we'll deport people who are criminals. Um, but they would never think about doing that for a white Australian. So you could be a third, fourth generation uh, Muslim Australian or Asian Australian and people would start completely, you know, send them back to where they came from. People from the Middle East are all the same. Uh, and post 9-11, there's this association in the public mind uh, with two things. One is ethnic crime, because we've had a big uh, ethnic crime debate in Sydney, uh, criminals of Middle Eastern appearance, which encourages that general stereotyping. But also, of course, post 9-11, the most extreme form of ethnic crime, which is terrorism. And that's um, been the case, despite the fact, of course, that uh, Australia's Muslim population is tremendously diverse. The problem with the stereotyping of the language of Middle Eastern appearance or Muslims do this and that is that people aren't treated as individuals. Uh, they're sort of um, treated as this big collective group and unfortunately uh, that collective group of Middle Eastern or Muslim people is generally then the next word is troublemakers, criminals, terrorists uh, and that's the danger because you know sort of these Australians suffer greatly individually and personally. So you, the most difficult thing for me upon growing up was being blamed for something which I didn't do, for something which I didn't do and I, when I say that I mean as a Muslim community as a whole. You know there are some people who may do certain bad things it doesn't mean that you as they say uh, you know there are people who portray themselves as something when they're not. Then the people, uh, other people of other communities will judge you as them. And this is very, very difficult to deal with because I have a voice. Many other Muslims have voices, but we are not heard. And this is something that's very difficult. I find that very heavy on my heart. And I wish, I wish that I would be given the opportunity to be able to voice myself so I can explain myself so we can talk about really what we are and not to be blamed for something which we didn't do. And moving right on with the Brothers panel for tonight, uh, we have some text that we're going to read out which has been a point that we've been mentioning for a while now. And uh, we start by saying Bismillah walhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallama ala Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah the Exalted and may Allah raise the rank of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his kind relatives and companions and protect his nation from that which he feed for them. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said in a hadith about, he mentioned about some uh, extremists, some fanatics. And uh, the Prophet told us that the extremist fanatics are doomed. And as we know, the Prophet والسلام, is the one who taught us about moderation. He taught us that Islam is a moderate religion and we do not resort to extre uh, extremism or anything like that. So he says, although extremism is not a new phenomenon, the, there's some rebel groups that uh, we know of that uh, witness today that requires prompt action and a strong resolve. And 